because I'm a minute late. <clears throat> Pledge of Allegiance. Judge, would you lead us in the pledge, please, sir? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you, Judge. <clears throat> okay, we got roll call. Miss Marisa. Here. Here. Present. Gabby Gnor. She'll be on by remote, I think. Patrick Cottle. Present. Here. Here. Aaron Munoz. Here. Here. Thank you, ma'am. Agenda item three, the safety briefing. That Mr. Rendon, here he comes. Good morning, Board of Directors. Good morning, sir. Um, in case of an emergency, all directors will exit through the kitchen. Uh, everybody else will exit to my right. Uh, you will report to the uh, transfer station uh, next to the clock tower. During the emergency, please do not utilize the elevator. Do not return back to the building unless it's all clear. And if we have to shelter in place, we will shelter in the west side stairwell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rendon. All right, agenda item four, receipt of conflict of interest affidavits. Do we have any, Marisa? Thank you, ma'am. Right before this, I'm gonna take a point of privilege, chairman privilege. I just wanna recognize Mr. Robert Adler, who passed away this past weekend one of the pillars of the community um, and uh, raised a lot of money for a lot of people and the founder of the Corpus Christi Mustangs that's raised over $5 million for nonprofits throughout our community. So I just want to take that moment <clears throat> to recognize him. Opportunity for public comment. Public comment. All right, we're gonna adopt some resolutions for the outgoing City of Corpus Christi appointed board members. Ms. Patricia B. Dominguez and Phillips Gavarska who didn't visit us today. Come on, Patricia. How do we do this, Walter? Do I need to read them? You want me to read it? Here, let me read it. Hang on, Patricia. Y'all bear with me, this is kinda long because Patricia's done so much. Whereas Patricia Dominguez served as an active member of the Corpus Christi Regional Transportation Authority Board of Directors following her appointment by the City of Corpus Christi in 2018, Patricia has championed quality transportation of students, individuals with disabilities, senior citizens, and the entire, entire community served by the Corpus Christi RTA. Whereas Patricia Dominguez guided the pursuit of Grant 5339B which supported the CCRTA with a $7.2 million for system developments. These improvements include the super stops and the route that served the Del Mar College, Oso Creek Southside Campus, the reconstruction of the Port Ayers Transfer Station and an updated parking lot at CCRTA's operations facility. Whereas Patricia Dominguez advanced innovative and accessible transportation to students of Del Mar College and Texas A&M University Corpus Christi's Viking Islander program, VIP Route 66, Crosstown Shuttle, provides a direct option for students to travel between campuses. Whereas Patricia Dominguez invested in the accessibility and equitability of CTRTA's transporta transportation network, Patricia aided in the development of the Port Aransas Express Route, <laughs> which delivers affordable and efficient transportation to Port Aransas for students, industry workers, and guests. She also led other service innovations throughout CCRTA's system, including CCRTA's first fixed route with on-call options, Flex, and the region's first autonomous shuttle, Surge. These innovations have directly benefited students, employees, and guests of higher education facilities. Whereas Patricia Dominguez was pivotal to the development of CCRTA shelter refurbish, refurbishment program, which has supplied nearly 200 new state-of-the-art TOLAR and refurbished shelters throughout the CCRTA service area. And whereas, Patricia Dominguez ensured that CCRTA served the community during the pandemic and when the region was affected by extreme weather conditions, 
Patricio also worked to improve the safety and security of employees, customers, and visitors through training engagements and increased security presence within the CCRTA system. Whereas, Patricio Dominguez was a dedicated leader for the CCRTA who advanced accessible and innovative services for our region's students, employees, and community members. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Corpus Christi Regional Transportation Authority Board of Directors that Patricia Dominguez is hereby commended for a distinguished service to the community, duly passed and adopted the sixth day of July, 2022. Well, everyone, it's been an honor to serve. And um, <clears throat> this ain't goodbye. You know, I'm going to see you guys. Yeah. And um, I continue to uh, be a champion for students, the students in this community and all the surrounding communities we serve. And so uh, this is not goodbye. This is I will see you guys later. Remember, y'all coming to South Campus, my new campus. And I will be there, and so will RTA. Right? Yes, Thank you. You call us anytime. Thank Patricia, again, thanks for your service. Uh, I'd like to get, take another point of privilege here. I would go left to right for all the board of directors if you'd like to say anything to Patricia publicly. Mr. Aaron. Uh, I know we didn't have that much time to work together, but you know, I, I, def I definitely want to thank you for uh, you know, your, your service on the RTA. And you know, you're, you're one of the first pe persons that, when I texted everybody up on here, uh, one of the first persons that reached back out to me to want to uh, sit down with me and have breakfast and give me the opportunity to get to know you. And so, like you said, it's not the, it's not the end. So I definitely do see you. And thank you so much for your service and, and, and your service. Patricia, we're going to miss you. Uh, you've always been there to support the big issues. You're always about the students and the ridership. I think that's extremely important sometimes to lose focus what our main mission is and the, the ridership is the important, important thing and I know that you have your heart in the right place for all the students that use it everyone but especially the students since you're a big supporter and pillar of our community with uh, Del Mar College thank you Patricia I really appreciate your advocacy so much and it's just a testament to the uniqueness that we each bring to this board we're gonna miss your passion for the students and, and their mobility for them and the new campus. We're so excited to be a part of that and 
eager to celebrate that with you again. Sana? Patricia, I'm sad to see you go, but I'm happy for you at the same time because I know you have bigger and better things to do. Um, you're gonna, you're, you've always been a great mentor and a great friend to me, so I appreciate you very much. Director Wilbright. Uh, echoing what everyone else has said, I really appreciate your advocacy for Del Mar and the students and using, uh, we have a shared vision of the RTA as an economic engine for uh, people that are trying to go places, and I think that's been a great thing. So I look forward to serving with you, and best of luck. Judge. I just want to wish you luck on, on uh, your new campus. Um, I know I'm, I'm new to the board, so we didn't get to talk that much, but the few times that we did uh, you know, communicate, you were always real nice to me, and, and I appreciated your insight, so good luck. I wish you the best of luck. It was great getting to know you on the short time that we were, we've were we served on the board, but um, I really appreciate you and all the efforts that you did for the RTA. Patricia, thank you for everything. Everything. And uh, do great things out there. I know you will. Um, and uh, I'll come see you in your new office. And uh, it might be at 5 o'clock, though. <laughs> 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 so we can go somewhere after. <laughs> but thank you so much for your service. You, you were a ardent supporter of all the students and making sure people could go from Del Mar to A&M Corpus and uh, you definitely were the, uh, the uh, leader on that and we really appreciate your leadership here on this board. Thank you so much Patricia. Thank you ma'am. Give her a big hand. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Have a good week. All right, what's next here? So do we need to vote on adopting the resolution formally? Yes. Do I have a motion? So moved. Got a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries unanimous. All right, let's see. All right, now we're up for the other big one. Agenda item seven, administer the oath of office of the City of Corpus Christi appointments and the City of Corpus Christi reappointments to the CCRTA Board of Directors. We have Mr. Jeremy Coleman, Ms. Erica Mamie, I hope I said that right, Ms. Gabby Canales, Mr. Eloy Salasad, and Mr. Matt Wilbright. Would you all please go front and center to, to get the uh, oath of office, please? Yeah, and there's there's always paperwork involved, just so you know. Mr. Coleman. So you haven't bribed anybody. <laughs> Eric. There you go. That's what we do. It's the first one. That's fine. You're good. Yeah, you can stand up there with the other folks. Glad to see you again. Yes. This is kind of got almost like getting lined up and shot, almost. <laughs> <laughs> Your head's in the gutter. get pictures with everybody what about with the councilmen that are here to represent the, the councilmen would y'all like to come up and uh, uh, take a few pictures councilman
Are you ready? One more. All right. Thank you. Excellent. Congratulations. Come take your position on the on the dice. Adisa, would you please show them where they're supposed to go? Just so you know, uh, new board of directors, the mic is always hot. <laughs> so watch what you say. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll give uh, take another point of privilege. Toward her, if that's all right, uh, Mr. Coleman. Would you like to say have any words? Well, um, I'm excited to work on this uh, board RTA, um, partnering with everyone here and including our city. Um, I have done tremendous research on the history and where it's been and where it's going and I think that um, this is a great board to, to sit on and I just want to thank everyone especially with our city who our, our elected officials who made the recommendation to appoint me on here so I look forward to working with everyone including you Mr. Chairman and the staff. Thank you Director Comer. Thank you very much. Director Mamie would you like to say anything? Well I'm happy to be here um, same you know, born and raised here in Corpus, and I'm happy to be part of, you know, something larger than what I, being a mom and, and you know, going to work every day. So I'm excited to work with everyone here. I uh, myself have done a lot of research on the RTA, uh, the different projects that um, the board is currently working on, and excited to be a part of it. Well, thank, thank you, you so you. much. Thank you for being here, and congratulations to you both. And thank you, council members, for being here today. <clears throat> All right, uh, we're on agenda item eight, awards and recognition. Uh, the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting for 2020. You're up, Mr. Cruz Aedo. Uh, Mr. Chair and, and board members, uh, welcome for the new members and, and good to have uh, everybody back uh, with us. At the, at the meeting. On June 8th of this year, the Corpus Christi Regional Transportation Authority received the Government Finance Officers Association Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting for the report year 2020. The, the Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition in governmental accounting and financial reporting. Its attainment represents a significant accomplishment by the CCRTA staff and the management team. CCRTA has earned the GFOA Certificate of Achievement, which is a significant review process of, of, of our financial reports to ensure they clearly communicate the financial position to our community. Have received the award for 17 straight consecutive years. I'm very pleased to present the board and the accounting staff and finance staff this certificate of achievement. Robert, do you have the run down the uh, certificate? Great.
appendix of the red brief. Page uh, 16. Congratulations. Would you like to say anything, Sam? I just want to thank ahead, everyone you because talk into the, mic for the, <laughs> the recognition really goes to my staff because we all, uh, it was a very challenging uh, year. It has been for the last two years, but I have a very dedicated staff. But I, it also is a collaborative effort throughout all the employees of RTA, all the way up to the CEO. Thank you for your leadership, uh, Jorge, and the board of directors, because it makes it a lot easier. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Anybody from the board like to say anything? We go from left, left to right again. Pick on Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> no, just great job. Congratulations. Mr. Coleman. Yep, congratulations, ma'am, and to your staff as well. Director Salazar. Congratulations to the team, especially Robert, that always gives us those answers to those really tough questions and always has an answer that we can support. Director Mamie. Congratulations to you and your staff. Great work. Terry Allison. Thank you, Sam, Robert. What a great team and big job that you carry on your shoulders. Ms. Gerana. Thank you, Ms. Sandy. Thank you to your staff as well. We appreciate you guys, and we look forward to getting your A team too. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Good. Director Wilbright. Phillip's not here anymore, so I'll take his uh, role. Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Judge. Congratulations, everyone. Good work. Director Chato. Congrats, Sandy. I'm so proud of you. I know personally the hard work that you put into financials. Um, so I'm so proud of you. And congratulations, Roberts, and to all the finance team, because I know it takes a, uh, takes a team to do uh, this kind of work and get this kind of recognition. So again, congratulations. Congratulations. And I'm with uh, my vice chair here. <laughs> We're looking for 18. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but congratulations. Thanks for making us look so good. Appreciate it. Thank you. OK. Uh, agenda item nine, announcement of committee chairs and appointments of, by the board chair in action to confirm committee chairs and appointments. Okay, what I'd like to do is uh, replace uh, Mr. Skabarskik and Ms. Uh, Dominguez uh, with, let me find my notes, <coughs> with uh, Director Coleman on the Ops Committee and um, uh, Director Mamie on the Admin committee and everybody else stays the same and then for the rural and small communities I'd like to nominate uh, chair Lynn Allison chair and add uh, director Canales and director Coleman the rural and small communities uh, committee so I have a motion so moved a motion to have second second, second. I have a second yeah. no, I didn't hear where the second came from hear me I have a second, second. Any discussion, oh, yeah, anybody? Okay. My bad. Is there any discussion on this? Hearing no discussion, all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. All right. Where are we at? Agenda item 10. Discuss some possible action to approve the Board of Directors meeting minutes of June 1st, 2022, and the Strategic Board of Directors retreat of June 3rd. 2022. You had this in your packet. Do I have a motion? So moved, Mr. Chair. You do I have a second. Looking for a second. Second. Who was who that? Gonzalez. Thank you, Judge. Any discussion? Any corrections, deletions, additions? There are none. All in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Committee chair reports. <clears throat> All right, I think uh, Director Canales is on vacation this week. Is she, is she on by remote by chance? Did you make it? I can see there. I don't know if that's her. Gabby, are you there? Okay. <clears throat> Ops, uh, Director Salazar. Nothing to report at this time. There were some questions that were raised the last time. I think staff, Derek, will those and, and new committee chair 
Director Allison, Secretary Allison. I look Allison. forward to working with this team and, and reaching in the outreach of the rural communities and to make sure all corners of the community are involved and, and um, get their fair share of attention from us. Great. Thank you so much, and thank you for uh, agreeing to do that. Okay. Uh, agenda item 12. This is the consent agenda. Uh, <clears throat> we've got agenda 12A, action to award contracts to CD Starter Service LLC, Cummins Southern Plains and Gillig for external and internal engine parts, and B, action to enter into an interlocal agreement with Dallas Area Rapid Transit for go pass subscription and license. Are there any issues with agenda item 12A or B? There were none. Do I'll entertain a motion. I'll move. Direct Salazar. Director Salazar, motion, do I have a second? Second. Where'd that come from? All right. Director Chavo, thank you, ma'am. Any further discussion? Hear none, all in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, <clears throat> agenda item 13, discussion and possible action to award a, a contract to the Christian LLC DBA Carlisle Insurance for Windstorm and Hail Insurance for Fiscal Year 2022 through 2023. Mr. Rendon. Good morning again. Uh, it is under the Port Priority Safety and Security. Okay, so um, Director Allison um, had requested a timeline, so this is going to be a different, a little bit different compared to the committee meeting. Uh, so the background on the uh, Arcuse LLC DBA Carlisle Insurance has provided windstorm and hail insurance for the last four years. As you can see there, uh, from 2018-19, it was at 84,000. Then it went up to 92,000, a little over that, 10% increase, and then it went to 109, 20% uh, increase, and then uh, last year it was at 132, 048. 22% uh, increase from the prior year. And uh, insurance will expire at the end of July 27 of this year. Um, so we brought this uh, RFP uh, to the administration committee uh, in March, and then the board approved it at the board of directors in April, and on the 19th, uh, the proposal were issued. We did post a couple of times on the uh, Color Times and uh, also on our website. And then we uh, posted on the B2G Now, which is um, about 100 uh, insurance companies throughout the United States. We did have about 45 hits. That means that they, were, they looked at it. And then after that, we had a total of 186, meaning that those 45 companies that looked at it, they, they went back and forth at least four times. Uh, so there was some uh, good notice throughout the U.S. And then uh, um, on May 3rd, uh, we had a pre-proposal conference held here at the Board of Directors uh, off, uh, room. And then uh, on, on May 10th, uh, we did have two companies, uh, uh, Risk Resource, uh, which is a local company in the area. And then we had uh, HDC Insurance uh, agency submitted RFI, a request for information. And May 31st, uh, we only received one proposal. Uh, and then June, the evaluation team met and Carlisle received the high score of 93.80. So the policy uh, <coughs> specs, you see on, on the right side, total 3% uh, name storm, 100,000, uh, all, all, all other wind storms. Uh, windstorm and hail 50 per occurrence, which is what we're talking about here at 242. And we have the option of 20 million loss of 189. Option two is uh, name storm and wind hail if you add another 2% to 5%, which is uh, 210. Now, Mike, can you Mike, advance the screen? Is that on the next slide? Yeah, next, uh, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, so let me go back. So option one, as you see on the right side, we do have a 3% name storm. Uh, which the uh, total was two, 242,744. Uh, and then uh, option two, uh, we have a name storm with a 2% increase, a uh, 5% of 210. We do save a little bit more, but the risk is a little bit higher. So we do have um, our 
consultant and uh, representatives from uh, Carlisle Insurance here that will explain in this detail because it's complex and they're uh, better knowledge of, of this. The policy will uh, term will uh, is from July 28th of this year through July 27th of 2023. So on June 10th, the best and final offer was submitted by Arcusier LLC, DBA, Carlisle Insurance. Uh, it stayed the same. And then uh, submitted premium uh, from last year to this is a difference of 110696 an 83% increase from the previous year. June 17, the, uh, the authority entered into an agreement with Carlisle Insurance to be our broker. Uh, at this time, uh, uh, you know, it, the, the price remained the same. You know, we were hoping that w he, they could have negotiated a, a better price from the carriers. Um, so, you know, they did uh, make contact with some of the carriers and they'll probably explain a little bit more in detail on that. But for right now, our recommendation uh, is to staff request the uh, board of directors uh, and our CEO or Destiny a one-year contract to Arcusier LLC, DBA, Carlisle Insurance for windstorm and hail insurance coverage not to exceed the 242, 744 for the year coverage of 2022 to 2023. Thank you, Mr. Rendon. Any questions for Mr. Rendon? Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, sir. sir, can you give me that number again? Did you, or how many um, insurance companies you said y'all reached out to? Did I miss that? It was, there is a uh, website about 100 insurance uh, companies throughout the U.S., okay? And then, uh, plus local here also. Uh, out of those 100, there was 45 um, uh, interactions with that particular post, okay? And out of those 45, um, some of them went back a total of, of 186. So that means they were looking at it back and forth and decided maybe uh, high risk, maybe, I don't know. But I can tell you that I was in Chicago last week and there was a particular company, uh, risk management, that was selling insurance. Uh, and we had a conversation and they were one of the ones that participated in this um, uh, you know, uh, RFP. Um, the first thing they, they told me is if you guys are right on the coast and you were high risk, that's why our company didn't really want to participate. So in the past, it's, it's always been one company, maybe two that participate and uh, it's, it's a high risk uh, insurance. And uh, so maybe that's the reason that, you know, we don't have more, more participating. Uh, we do do a due diligence. We started, like, in, like I said in, in my presentation, in, uh, in March. So that's over 90, 90 days of, of everybody trying. Uh, uh, the uh, procurement uh, office, you know, putting out the RFP as best as we could, and locally, statewide, national. And it's, you know, it's, it's hard to, for us to get more than one uh, participating. Thank you, sir. Any other questions for Mr. Rendon? I, I have one. Yes, sir. Yeah. Director Salazar. Um, I had mentioned last at the meeting about TWIA, but TWIA can only insure up to 4.2 million. Is that correct? Up to, up to four, 4 million, yes. Four and, million. and our assets are 45 million. Because yeah, so. I, I had re requested because typically TWIA, but the fact that they're limiting the coverage, I thought that was unusual, but I looked into it. Um, 4.2 million is the cap that they will insure. The second thing is, did we look at uh, higher deductibles? I think, was it in the presentation? Well, yes. It went up, you know, we presented oh. a 3% uh, uh, at um, our committee meetings, and then we had the option, too, of 5%. What is the difference again? Could you go back to that slide? I think you showed it, but I just don't think you highlighted it. There. At 2%, it'll be the uh, 210. Six, six, three. So if we go to five percent, we save thirty thousand dollars. Correct, and it's it's an increase right around fifty nine, sixty percent. What's this optional twenty thousand dollar loss limit? What is it? Twenty million. Uh, right 30%. underneath total, it says 
optional twenty thousand dollar loss limit, one hundred eighty nine thousand seven fifty six for the bill. That's twenty million, I think, director. Good morning. My name is Chase Corlow. I'm Vice President of Corlow Insurance. Good the morning, sir. Uh, the 20 million is a loss limit. What we consider a loss limit is that's the maximum the policy would pay out in any one loss. So um, if you look around us at local entities around us, such as the City of Corpus Christi, CACSD, I know we're talking much larger schedules, but nobody buys full wind limits. We all buy loss limits because the odds of a, a total loss to your assets from a windstorm event are uh, pretty slim. So the next thing we would look at is what's the, the maximum value per item on the schedule, such as this building, it's this one. This one's on the schedule for approximately $23 million in value. Um, normally, hurricanes, windstorm events are not something that's going to total out a building. We could have significant damage if we lose a roof or something of that nature with water coming down from the top story all the way down, but the structure of the building is more than likely still going to be here. What we would be concerned about would be a fire taking out the building, but we're not discussing fire insurance today. So that's why we did provide an option to just buy a $20 million loss limit um, and I think the overall savings would be close to $50,000 there. Uh, one other follow-up. On the buildings uh, themselves, for example, we have coverage for $45 million. Is that right? More yes, sir. And of that, the, the structure is $35 million? I believe it's on the schedule for $23 million. Twenty-three. Okay, yes, so sir. the others, if there's a loss, is the 5% attributable to the entire, or is it each individual uh, structure? The 5% deductible? Yes, sir. Or it's 3%, whatever it is. It's uh, per, structure. per structure. It's listed as per unit of insurance on the schedule, but y'alls are listed out per building okay. on the schedule. So it's per building. Per building. So, so it's only applicable to whichever building has damages affected. Well, yeah, because it makes a difference. If this it building's 5%, difference. it's very different than if we use the entire global policy that some people might have. Yes, sir. It makes a very big difference. But on that same note, does the $20 million apply per structure? So that would be for our entire content. Yes, ma'am, it's it's policy level. So it would be for the entire $45 million of assets that you have, uh, the maximum the policy would pay out would be $20 million of damage after the deductible. Any other questions? Sure. Yes, Director Wilbright. Uh, $45 million, what are the other assets? Where's the other $22 million coming from? Uh, I don't Ballpark. have a schedule offhand. Do you, do you have imagine it's Bear Lane. I can uh, read some of the larger ones. The other stru structures are like the operation building in Bear Lane, the maintenance, the fuel station, two of our uh, big uh, bus stops, which is the uh, uh, Momentum bus stops over there on uh, Ennis uh, Jocelyn for the university. So those are the uh, so this major. Is all facilities. doesn't include any of the actual buses. No, that's uh, the general liability. Okay, so this is just facilities. Uh, structures, yes, sir. What are all the facilities built for hurricane standing wise? What's the rating? Oh, the wind, the wind, you mean? Correct. I don't know that, sir. No, getting back with you. I imagine the insurance company probably does. What's the rating that all these buildings are built for? They don't use that information in underwriting. So the underwriting is based on the age, the, the type of construction, the age of the roofs, um, and the location approximately to the coast. So. For example, the uh, new bus stops that we're putting in at Del Mar that are fairly expensive, if they're rated for a Cat 5 hurricane, there's no bearing on if those are going to be damaged or not? Not necessarily. It would, it would be based on the uh, construction of that bus stop. So, for instance, this building, I'm assuming this is a masonry constructed building, um, it models, and we've talked about model, they, they run it through a computer system to see what the damage would be in a Cat 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. This one models better than the light metal construction sure. bu bus barns that are on the other side of town. So that's how the, the rating is based out. And if you yes. ran up those ratings, uh, Cat 5 Hurricane, what's the max damage that you see happening? I don't have that offhand. I can get that for you, though. Okay. Um, uh, I'll put it this way. When we look at the pricing, um, you look at the pricing here, you can see it. It's 190000 for the first $20 million. Uh, the next $25 million costs you another 30000 so that tells me that the risk is under 20 million. Right. They're not pricing the other 25 million very much. And then when Hurricane Harvey came through, do we have any damage? Uh, no, we didn't. We had minor, but no, no heavy uh, damage. What about the? Uh, gosh, I forget the name. Was it Anna? Anna. 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 What about Anna? The same. Okay. So, uh, in my mind, if. We have two hurricanes that have hit, one of which had probably Cat 1 force winds here. 
I think the odds of us having a total wipeout of every building, particularly this building, are pretty slim at best. And like he mentioned, the fire is the biggest risk of any hurricane, especially a large building of this size, and this isn't covered under there. Is that correct? So if a windstorm comes in, throws a power line to the building, and the building catches on fire, we're not covered under this policy. That's a tricky one. That's a tricky one. I would it's tend to say yes, that's going to be considered part of the windstorm, um, but they could point a finger and say no, it's part of the fire policy. But you would agree that's the biggest risk to this building? Fire? Correct. For sure, yes. Yeah, I mean, this, this building is, uh, is a well-constructed facility. I mean, it's, we've got lots of glass. I don't know, maybe somebody knows if the glass is wind rated or not. Um, but even at that, like I said at the beginning, um, we're not going to have this building totaled out. I mean, the odds of that happen are slim to none. Uh, we could have, we could possibly have a, you know, $10, $15 million loss, though, from water damage. You know, if you lose the roof, uh, we saw claims like that in Harvey, or the, the structure, specifically condo buildings on the island that are, you know, eight-story condo buildings. The structure was fine. The windows, maybe a few windows were blown out, but the integrity of the roof was gone, so the water came down from the roof and went down all eight floors of it. It caused significant damage, okay. but the structure is still there. So the second uh, second question I have uh, deals with the broker of record. Uh, we were told a couple weeks ago that there would be probably or potentially an advantage of having y'all's broker of record and having potentially lower prices, and I was fairly skeptical we would get anything lower. And we didn't, uh, but, but someone else, a uh, competitive option, who's not the broker of record, is a lower policy. How does that add up? What's the advantage of having you as a broker of record? I'm not sure I understand the competitive option is a lower policy. So on the screen right here, there's the same coverage. That's, but it's that's my quote. So it's a different alternative option. Yes, so why sir. do we have so the top we, one? When we turned in our RFP response, we provided all three of those options up front. So why were we recommended the 242? That was uh, two weeks ago, but then uh, viewing the option two, you know, we're, we're giving you that option to take a little bit more uh, a risk on the percentage from three, three to five. I guess my, my question is, the recommendation here is that we go with a more expensive policy. Why is that? Correct, because that was the one that we had. Th that's why, where the board of directors have the option to take option two. You know, they can, we recommend this, but as you can see, you know, it's a higher, a little bit more risk. And is, if the board of directors are willing to do that, then that's the option to, that you can, guys can vote on also. It's going from 3% to 5%. Correct. Jorge, For a lower you, premium. Jorge, can you chime in on why the staff recommendation is the higher premium? Staff, when they were, were, were addressing the proposals and uh, looking at the coverage, the initial coverage was recommended, which was the, the 3%. Correct. As I understand, Mike, today is bringing the option for us to also consider potentially a 5%. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a little higher risk and, and lower, lower uh, cost of difference, I think it's like 30,000. Ron looks like he has an answer over here. You know, when you when you talk about these different options, deductible options, all this kind of stuff, it, if you'll see, it doesn't move the needle significantly, right? I mean, fifty thousand dollars, fifty thousand dollars is quite a bit of money, but percentage-wise, it's not that big of a difference to take on effectively another million dollars of deductible. So when we look at deductible options, it's no different than you look at your homeowners, your auto insurance. Everybody has a different risk tolerance, right? Um, somebody, maybe staff, thinks it's not worth taking another, you know, million dollars of deductible to save fifty thousand dollars. Me, on the other hand, I'm the type that likes to take a high deductible because I, I sell this stuff all day, I look at the statistics, odds are you're not going to ever use your insurance, right? So I, I'd rather keep the money in my pocket than pay the money out. So my recommendation um, would be to consider either the 5% or look at the $20 million loss limit. Can we do a combination of the both? Uh, you can. I, would I, would have to get like? that, I would have to get that revised pricing for you, but... Um, you know, it, it's hard for me to tell offhand if, if I had to just throw a, a number out there uh, based on the 190 at the $20 million loss limit to go from a 5% or 3% to the 5%, uh, may drop it another fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000. So at that point, we're then within the range of the industry standard for increases and within our policy of accepting a single bid based on pricing. 
Yeah, and, and you know, just, just some background. How did we get here, right? I mean, that's probably what everybody's sitting here wondering. How, do, how does our insurance keep going up 10%, 20%, 22%, right? 80%. Um, and then 80%. Yeah, it's an excellent question. Um, if you look at property insurance or just in, insurance in general over a 40-year period, but specifically property insurance windstorm that we're talking about right now, it's a very cyclical market. There's ups and downs. Every peak is driven by natural disasters. We go into what we call these soft markets and hard markets. Soft markets mean rates coming down, deductibles coming down, it's good for the consumer. Hard markets, the complete opposite, which is what we're in right now. Uh, we had been in a soft market uh, effectively from Hurricane Katrina up until 2017. On annual, the global catastrophic losses for the industry are $20 billion. 2017, we know what we had. We had Hurricane Harvey, we had Irma, and we had Maria. That year alone, depending on which report you read, was close to $200 billion in losses. So that triggered the change from the soft market to the hard market in 2017. Those natural disasters and social distress, whatever you want to call it, that's happened from 2017 up in 2022 has not stopped. So the market continues hardening every year. 2021, you know, we locally, we didn't see a whole lot. We did have the big Texas freeze. Uh, when I saw the numbers, I was a little bit shocked, but that was the second most costliest year the industry had ever saw at about 120 billion um, in global losses. Um, between the state of California catches on fire every year, uh, Louisiana had two significant hurricanes last year, Florida pretty much gets one every year, um, earthquakes, just everything around the world uh, affected those losses. So those losses have not stopped. Historically, when we look at the graph over 40 years, eventually it does, uh, but we're in an unprecedented territory right now where stuff's happening that, that normally doesn't happen. I mean, we had tornadic activity up in the Midwest in December of last year, and that, that normally does not happen. So. Uh, we can't predict that. Only God can predict when that's going to stop. But at this point, it has not. And that's why we're seeing what we're seeing. And so what I would tell you is, just like anything, if this, if I was sitting here as, as you all running this business, is in these hardened markets is the time when you take more risk. These are the times where you raise your deductibles, where you pull back on the type of coverages you're buying. When we get back in the soft market and rates are coming down 20%, then we can go out and buy these nicer things like lower deductibles, more coverage, et cetera. So that, that's what I would say to consider. So it sounds like your recommendation would be a 5% deductible with the loss limit. Um, I'm not sure I would recommend the 5% on the loss limit because I'm not sure it justifies saving fifteen or 20000 to take on another million dollars of liability in that deductible. So why I would, would definitely say I would consider that $20 million loss limit. So the last question I have then is why would the drop on the 3% deductible be almost fifty grand, um, whereas on a 5% deductible it's only fifteen? I, was, I think I specified five, it would be 15 from the 189. So that's at a 3%, 20 million. So maybe another 15, 20,000 dollar reduction to go from a three to a five on that 20 million loss. So you'd be down to like one. Yeah, maybe down to 170, 175 ish. Okay. And again, those are just numbers I'm yeah, throwing sure. out. I'll have to get it remodeled and underwritten. Mr. Chairman, I have one other comment. Question. Yes, sir. Director Salasab, you have the floor. Um, so just for clarity, and I, I mentioned it already, but for example, the single amount of law, total loss on this structure would be 5% of this structure, which is $23 million. Is that correct? Um, it's talking about the deductible or the, the coverage? The de well, the coverage on the building, the total is 45, but you said that the coverage, the amount of this, this specific building is, building million, is so 23 million. million. Okay. Yes, sir. So the total, the amount of total loss. It would be 5% of so, yeah, this structure, this building, not the $45 million, is that correct? Correct. So this building specifically, if we just had damage to this building, which is the largest asset on the schedule, so let's just talk about that, the 5% deductible on this building alone is $1.1 million. And, and, and to Mr. Woolbright's point is that this is probably one of the more well-built structures. It's newer. Some of the other facilities, if it's 5% of that, maybe we have one that's a million dollars, then the amount of deductible would be less. So. We correct. were thinking, some of us were thinking, 5% of $45 million, but that's not correct. It's per, that's why I wanted to make sure that the yeah, board it, it's understood per building. You're right. that I, it's I just per structure, and it would be correct. nice just for point of information to have all the different structures. If something does happen, the 5% is not as bad as it looks simply because of the actual amount of coverage and the amount that we would have to pay. Yeah, you're, you're spot on. I, I just always look at it as worst case scenario. Well, we have a cap if, five if, if up through here. We're going to have damage I everywhere. But 
you base it on individual structure because the cost yeah. of repairing this building is going to be much higher, but a, another property, the other $20 million, is going to be much less. Sure. Th th this asset here is about half of all our assets. My point. But yeah, the, the, the other stuff, and it's the stuff that's going to blow away first, is the light metal construction stuff correct. on the other side of town. And five Those are lower values, right. so they're going to have a lower deductible and of 5%. The, and the deductible amount on that is very nominal. So anyway, just and the point the deductible is five percent of the damage or five percent of the asset. Five percent of what the asset is listed on the schedule. The for. structure it. itself. So in other words, each structure I'll has give a five percent or three percent deductible. I wanted so to make sure the board understood that part. Of it. So let's just look at yeah, one. So, so, so let's we can, look at. So we can keep things flowing here. Yeah. If y'all would raise your hand so I can give you the floor. <laughs> just a question. So, yeah, Madam Secretary, uh, and then uh, Madam Vice Chair, you're next. Thank you for being here, Mr. Sure. Carlisle. We do appreciate it, and I appreciate your candor, which is, I know it's been an unpopular topic, and I appreciate your recommendation, even though it's ways from staff. So thank you for that. Um, you mentioned the freeze last year I impacting the rates. So that's considered a windstorm? No, but the, the carriers that we're buying just windstorm from are also writing the all other perils from other okay. entities. So. For example, um, and here's another thing just so we can talk about real quick and not to drag everybody through insurance, but when we were in the soft market, so four years ago when we picked up your business, we had one carrier on the placement. Today, we have to put two or three carriers to fill out the $45 million of coverage because there's no, the carriers now are pulling back on what they want to write, especially on the Texas and Louisiana coast. Um, so now we're having to stack carriers together to build out these types of limits. At the $20 million loss limit, that's one carrier. So that's that's a different. But these carriers that we're proposing today are the same carriers that are writing the, the fire and everything else on the city of Corpus Christi, and Oasis County, everybody around us as well, um, as well as throughout the world. So those those global losses aren't specific to just windstorm. Like I said, the fires in California, earthquakes, et cetera, but they're providing coverage for that too. Mine's more of a, a question for staff. So let's just say that we decide on going with the $20 million loss limit. and We have a storm come in and we have a total loss. Where, where are we going to get the monies from to rebuild? Or is it coming from our reserves or? That would be true, right, uh, Robert? Obviously, we would, we would collect whatever insurance we can collect, and the remaining of it would come from unrestricted reserves. Okay, so what if our reserves are committed to, let's just say, rent? Well, that's why I say unrestricted reserves. So we have restricted reserves uh -huh. that have for operational costs, for benefits, and for health care. Okay, so whatever we, we don't use from that, okay. we typically will go from unrestricted reserves and use that, which is about 25 million ish. Um, well, you'll see in the financial statement, it's usually about 31 million now because we pulled down 5.6 million dollars of federal funds. But I'll get to that in a little bit. So we'll pull up from that down, that, from that first, and if that were to some reason exceed that, then we'd go into the restricted reserves that we have, which would be the operational, the health care, and what have you. So we have to get it from somewhere. And, that, and we would also, myself, I would recommend that we would start looking at our capital projects for the rest of this year and putting those on, on, the, on the back burner and use some of those dollars and, and push off a project that doesn't really need to be done this year. So you're looking at your CIP a, then. You're saying if we had a... More CIP items that weren't completed or, or even started. You're, you're I would saying, say you're saying if we had a catastrophic, if we had a catastrophic event and it was exceeding this, that. this summer, correct. Okay, and then another question I have is, um, <clears throat> we're renewing during hurricane season. Does this impact our rates at all? If we renew now versus if we renew during like December the first, out of hurricane after season. After the after the windstorm season. That's an excellent question. Yes, it does. Um, we're not in what we consider the peak of hurricane season at this point. Uh, that's August and September. If we were trying to renew at that point, it would be a disaster. So I think we're still okay in July. Would it be better June 1st? Uh, probably not. I mean, about the same. It would be worse towards the end of the year. And the reason is uh, most of the reinsurance contracts for these carriers renew on January 1st. So they have a full glass of water. They got to go out and sell insurance. As that water gets lower, it becomes more expensive, especially if you have any losses throughout the summer during hurricane season. So November, December is not a good time. We're okay probably July 28th. If it was any closer to uh, September, I would say no. Um, the only thing that would be a concern is if we had an early storm in June or early July that affected us, then we could catch ourselves in a, a situation. But good question. Appreciate it. Who else is looking for the floor? Director Robart. Quick follow-up to that. Could we do a six-month contract and then reset our schedule to do it in 
February? Sure. It'll cost the same, though. Um, you're buying windstorm coverage, so the premium is almost fully earned throughout hurricane season. There's no risk for these carriers throughout the rest of the year. So if you did a six-month contract, they're going to come back and say, yeah, it's the same price. Is there anything that stops us from re-upping in February versus waiting until this contract comes uh, its course? Not necessarily. We will have a little bit of a return premium if we decided to cancel and rewrite it in February. Um, but again, it's not going to be significant. Uh, we can definitely look at that if you're interested in doing it, though. But the cost savings on the policy would be significant. No, sir. It would not be significant. Um, where it would help us is in the fact that we're not in storm season. We're at the beginning of the year. So people want to sell insurance. Everybody's happy. It's, you know, it's spring. The flowers out, right? Um, as we get to July 28th, the only thing that could affect us on our pricing at this point is the fact that we have an early season storm um, and people have a sour taste in their, their mouth about windstorm at that point. So I don't think it would significantly help you, um, but it could prevent us from finding ourselves in a situation in one of those early season storms. Can I ask, just because, and I apologize if this has been asked, but if we did re want to revisit this in the spring, could we prorate back the, if we went with the 210 or the 242 to, say, March, and then reinstate a new policy in March? Yeah, we, we can definitely do that. Um, I just don't know what the premiums are going to look like without, without running the numbers um, because, again, these policies are going to have almost a 90 to 95 percent minimum earn. Because once it goes into hurricane season, the premium is exposed. So, um, and we're just writing windstorm coverage. If we were writing the fire and everything put together, then definitely there would be a prorated return premium because the, we, we had two or three less months. But the fact we're going through the entire hurricane season, they're going to look at it as that premium was fully earned. We exposed ourselves to that hurricane season. Um, the, only, the only savings we'd have is June 1st to July 28th of 2023 that they're not exposed. So we'd have a little bit of return premium. Yes, uh, Director Mamie. Um, did the did anything in the policy change um, as to why there was such a significant increase? You no, know, eighty percent is, is nothing changed other than the deductible went from a one percent to a three percent. So we had a one percent last year. Um, so, it was a, so the the deductible was lower. Last year was lower. And and if we would have renewed the exact same policy, what would have been what would have been the increase? I don't have that number. Um, this carrier was not willing to offer a 1% deductible, nor were they any of the other carriers. There are specific markets we can go to to buy that deductible down back to a 1%, but we did not do that. Just I looked at the premium and said, I'm pretty sure they're probably not interested in doing Just that. Just trying to compare, yeah. like, why such a drastic increase. It's, it's purely the market. Uh, um, you know, I sound like a broken record, but again, it's the market. Uh, when we talk about the broker record issue, let's just talk about that real quick. Um, there are just a handful of markets that are going to write risks such as this on the Texas coast or on the Gulf Coast period, right? For this, um, si for this size. <laughs> yes, sir. So um, when we go to the market or, you know, firm A goes to the market, the first broker to the market reserves that market for them to work on. When we access the markets uh, on your behalf this year, we found that there was five or six markets that had been accessed by another broker. So it prevented us from accessing those markets. So when we turned our bid in, I, I told you know Roland, I said, here's our bid. Um, there was a few markets that we were not able to access um, that I don't know if they would have been a better option or not. And I think that's when the staff presented it to y'all is, hey, if we name them as our broker record, they will be able to go access those handful of markets to see if there was a better uh, product or price on the table so we can improve on it. There was not. Those markets came back and declined to, to provide a quote at all. So that's why we didn't see any change in the price. I would like to see the price for the optional twenty million uh, loss limit with a five percent deductible. Okay. Anybody else need the floor? One of the yeah. things I have, uh, Mr. Carlisle, is yes, I would like and for staff to uh, move up the timeline on when we get these quotes, um, so we're not backed up against the wall, so to speak, sure. in time. I mean, we're in hurricane season already. We're still discussing this, so sure. if we can maybe bring this up in January or February, uh, Councilman, wait. Um, go ahead, sir. And it's rolling today. Rolling today. <laughs> rolling today. Yeah, today. Yes, sir. Today it's rolling. How about that? You know, and, and that's one of the things that I had brought up at the committee meeting. Yes, sir. That you know, uh, typically in this, and, and you as a business owner, and 
you know, all, all of you that, that have your own business, especially when you have property or assets that you're trying to um, uh, ensure, you, you, the, the typical system is one of which you engage a trusted professional to be able to do so. And so the, the, the situation that I've, I've, I've basically come up with is we've got an antiquated system where we don't know the score until the day everything comes in because basically we have this system of which everybody is given this piece of information and then you have this as uh, uh, Mr. Carlisle had brought up. So then they have, they have the, the, off, the, the chance unfortunately that they get knocked out of a market. So when, if we move to the system where we had said where we, um, we, we have some RFQ for which we assign an agent of record. In this particular case, they were an incumbent, so it, it made it a little bit difficult, you know, when I talked to, to, to legal counsel. But my, my point is, is that you get to a process, and then this way, this individual offers you some set of predictability. So that way they can, ha take and tell you where the market is, whether it's, whether it's a hard market of like where we're in. So that way, it's just the example for you when we're doing the health insurance, right now we're trying to calculate your budget for next year based on where the market has been. And I think that's the challenge and the frustration of you as a policymaking body is all of a sudden you have the surprise of this 80% increase. And, and it's simply because uh, I think there has to be an alternate procurement method so that way the, the, the broker of record can be engaging with you on a regular basis so that way there's some predictability about it. Well, as our risk management uh, consultant, can you work with staff to try to come up with a better process here? Absolutely, sir, absolutely. Anyway. Director Wilbright. Thanks, first. Sorry. Yeah. <coughs> Dr. Munoz. So just, so I'm, I'm still really new at this, and so forgive my ignorance when it comes to these types of things, but just to clarify, the 3% deductible is what would apply to the $20 million loss limit. Is that correct? No? No, it, uh, the 3 or 5% deductible applies to the value of the building affected. Got it. So again... I like to talk worst case scenario that we had damage at every single building. Um, it would be three or percent of the total forty-five million at that point. So, so those are two different options then. The twenty million dollar loss limit and the three percent deductible. Am I reading that correctly? Or am I wrong? Yes. Yeah, so the the two forty-two is a three percent deductible for full forty-five million dollars worth of coverage. The optional twenty million dollar loss limit for one eighty-nine is just $20 million of coverage, but still at a 3% deductible. Um, she's asked for a t that $20 million uh, loss limit at a 5% option as well. And was I correct when you said it would probably bring it down to about 175? Uh, that's just uh, a conjecture. Guess, but yes, I would anticipate somewhere around there. And that would bring us on an additional, potentially, a, you said a million dollars in yeah, liability? Yeah, I think I calculate it was $955,000 or something. For from going from a three percent to a five percent, fifteen grand. Yes, sir. Is that right? Yes, sir. Um. And and so I guess I guess the idea is that as we increase the deductible, potentially the that total the, that total amount that we're going to pay in premium is going to come down, right? Is that the Correct. theory behind it? Correct. At some point, it fizzles out um, because you start getting into. Uh, what we look at is, is the loss layers. The, the, the most expensive part of the steel is obviously the first $5 million of coverage, right, because that's where the loss is going to come from. So as you start creeping up into that self-insuring part and, and get to a point once you exceed where they think most of the loss is going to come from, there's not a whole lot of credit for increasing deductibles. Got it. So under the, under the $20 million option, I guess we're covered for damages and up to $20 million? Yes, sir. And we, how much of that do we front at the beginning? Uh, depends on which deductible you go with. If you went with the three percent, you're on the hook for the first 1.3 million. Again, if we had damage to every building, total, sure. total, 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 total damage to every building, about 45 million dollars worth of assets. Right. Yes. So if you had, when it doesn't have to be a total, it could be just a little bit. I mean, if we had, uh, just for instance, this building, I mean, we could have two or three hundred thousand dollars of damage, but we know we have a 1.1 million dollar deductible, so they're not going to pay anything out, right? Um, okay. But just talk about a, ca a catastrophe where you had damage at every building. Uh, Three percent, you're on the hook for the first 1.3 million, and at five percent, you're on the hook for the first 2.2 million. And Robert, how much do we have in? Uh, I call it uh, un unreserved, unreserved reserves. 
right. So <laughs> our overarching unrestricted reserves. Um, How much again? Court to Gatsby is about $51 million right now. We have put about 20, 25 million of that goes to restricted reserves for operational and all that. Right. So we have about, as of May, we have about $31 million of unrestricted reserves. So we got basically $31 million in cash. Well, in well, investment and some of the, yeah. But yes. Movable uh, money. Available money. Liquid like enough. That. It's liquid yeah. enough. Yes, yes. yes. Mr. Chair, I'm, yes, ma'am. I know there's probably more questions. I we could go on and on with the questions. I <coughs> want to just put on the record. I'm in favor of voting on the the five percent deductible option two or the optional twenty million dollar loss limit at three percent at twenty million. I am not in favor of voting at the twenty million dollar loss limit at five percent deductible. So. That if a we need to change a motion, is or that a, I, is that a motion? Well, I don't know how to make that motion because I'm in favor of voting on two options, but I am not in favor of a five percent deductible at a twenty million dollar loss limit. Right now, we've been quoted a three percent deductible up to one hundred and eighty nine thousand. Yes, ma'am. So, to make a motion, I'd have to say we need to vote on the. 5% deductible at 210000 or we need to vote on the $20 million loss limit at $189,000. Um, Your pleasure, ma'am. Mm. Director Allison, yes. I, I, I believe that you're, uh, if, if my interpretation is that you're with a 3% deductible and with a $20 million loss limit, saving you at 189000 Because even then, you know, once again, that you're going up by going to the 5%, as, as we had indicated, you're you're actually increasing. Is that the problem with the mic? That might be. That might <laughs> be <laughs> Miss Gabby. Gabby. Miss Gabby's on. Oh, here. okay. Yeah. Gabby's got back on. Yeah. Or Director Canales. My apologies. Yeah. Representative. Yeah. I've been on for a while, Representative. Anyway, uh, just uh, I, I, you know, here, here here's one thing to bear in mind, and maybe I'm going to digress too far. You know, one of the things that we did three years ago, I believe it was is that this asset was basically, uh, it was uh, listed as an asset of 30 million, 31 million. And so what we did is we recognized, okay, so uh, once again, that would be very, it, it was highly unlikely that this asset would, would have a total loss. And so that's when we moved that to the 23 million. So that's reflective actually in kind of some of the, some of the, the levelized increases that which we, ha we had. Now, what we did is that we took the risk in other words, we put it on the back end because, as, as, as Mr. Carlisle had indicated, the true nature of the cost is the first $5 million. Mm -hmm. So in, in one of the things that staff and, you know, that, that, that I had felt is that the challenge typically is probably not going to be with this building. It's going to be with the other older assets that we, which we have. So what you're having is that if you have the either the, the Bear Lane facility or the um, or the admin facility, uh, which was reconstructed when I was on the board in 2007. So you have that, that structure. So now you're, for, for the amount that you're decreasing the premium, um, what have you, you're, you're absorbing the risk on those buildings. So if, uh, once again, I probably maybe convoluted that whole thing, oh, but, but the thing that I would recommend is uh, basically the 3% name storm and mind you, once again, this is an up and ab above beyond the 1% because no other carrier was willing to do that. So the 3% deductible with the $20 million loss limit. Because once again, it's that first $5 million that really is where all the risk is. And, and thank you so much for that. And with that, I would like to make the motion with the caveat that I'm not satisfied overall with this. I feel like we are putting ourselves at risk, but in the situation, we need to come to a decision. Um, and given our unrestricted reserves, I am comfortable with making the motion that we accept the $20 million loss limit with the 3% deductible, and then that we go out and try to procure this, obviously, before hurricane season next year. That's right, my motion. Move up the proposal. Correct. Proposal term. All right. So we kind of got a double one. Does that work, John? Minus, I'll second that. All right. We got a second from... Director Canales, do we have any other discussion from any board member? Can, can we clarify that? That's yep. taking the option. Is that the 189,000 or the 242,000? The 189. The, the one, the, the lower portion of option one. <laughs> that should, to me, that should be option three. Um, so, so 189. The 189 with the 3% deductible. Right. That and includes the 3% yeah. deductible. And just the point of clarification on Director Maynard's point is that we don't know what that savings is going to be. 
that that's the only comment that I have. We don't really know. We don't have a conclusive number if we went with the optional, which is what uh, Erica made the point. Let me right. ask another question. Those. I'm sorry. Staff, are you comfortable with these? Uh, what option do you prefer? I mean, <clears throat> well, I mean, as you just heard, these guys are the expert in in uh, on the insurance and options. Um, you know, I did visit with uh, Roland before this meeting and and uh, discussed it with Chase uh, a bunch of times. So I, you know, I put this uh, scale there so you guys can see it. If it's uh, a good uh, option on, on that I mean, you know that's board of directors that's where you make those decisions you know i gave you uh three options uh i recommended something <laughs> i'm not uh, uh disappointed if you go in a different direction you know that's the responsibility of board of directors to to look at it and then m make a decision insurance just makes me nervous i just yes. feel like <laughs> i'm not willing to take the risk i don't want to take the risk Mike, the the, yes, an, the answer to the question is going to be that this is one of the options that we would recommend from the portfolio that's available today. Is it an option that we can live with? Yes. Can we also uh, exercise those uh, improvements to the system to help get it out a little earlier? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, we would n we would not be uncomfortable with the risk that uh, the option that we're considering would uh, would bring forward to the board. And Director Jimenez, you know, um, as, as someone that has, has sat in your seat and, uh, you know, uh, and, and a testimony of the character of your chairman and your ops committee chair, um, you obviously, they're business owners. Uh, they have a little bit more. I think uh, both of them would be considered mavericks in the community. <laughs> and so their risk tolerance is that of one that is greater. And I could tell you when this was discussed uh, among the, uh, the board, I mean, among the staff, which are, and I'll lose the term uh, loosely, bureaucrats. And as a former chief executive uh, prior here, he called them bureaucrats. <laughs> 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 and typically, bureaucrats or the individuals of staff, their risk tolerance is one of which it's lower. And I think when staff looked at it, and that's one of the reasons that staff made that recommendation, is okay, we're going from a 1% to a 3%. So we've increased our, our front end liability. We've gone from a 25% minimum occurrence to now 100 on a name storm and 50. So I think uh, staff at that time felt that it was much more prudent to be able to offer you that recommendation of the 242,000. Because when you look at it from the perspective of a budget of 35 million, it's true, 80% is hard to stomach. It's very hard to stomach. When you hear that number, it, it's like, we have to renegotiate, we have to look, we have to check the market. But when you get to that point where, once again, you look at the difference of uh, that, that dollar value in the grand scheme of a $35 million operating budget, I think that's what staff looked when they came up with a 242. But I, I would feel comfortable if I were sitting in your chair to say, as, as the recommendation was made, the $20 million loss limit with the 3% deductible. So hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. I, ha I have a motion on the floor. Do I have a second? I, I think second. it's been Gabby seconded. seconded. Uh, yeah. Any further discussion? Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Director Canales. I just have two and then a really quick. Promise. All right, <laughs> Director Wilbright, one more time. <laughs> Last two. Uh, first, at the Finance Committee meeting, we asked for a month-to-month -month extension number. Did we get that number? Somebody else asked me that the other day too. There's, there's not a carrier that's going to do a month to month contract. So there's no way to extend the current. No, sir. Okay. And then my and, and uh, we, second. We also one. asked last year for the same thing, and we didn't, we didn't get that extension. Yeah. So my second one was, I guess you answered that. So we did not have a renewal offer, even though we saw one. Is that correct? Correct. And then my last one is, uh, Director Mamie is a expert on insurance. It's what she does. So I'd really like to hear her thoughts before I vote on this. Okay. So I did some math. Um, this annual savings that we would have by um, choosing between the 3% or the 5% on the optional 20 is 177,000 and the difference that we would be risking is 222,000 um, on an annual basis. So the difference, you know, it's not much difference. So 
spend about $12,000 is what you're saying. If we went with the 5%, it would be about a $12,000 savings. About a fifteen, fourteen dollars to $15,000 savings. Yeah, so, I mean, that's, we're talking about one month free of insurance by choosing the 5% versus the 15. So what's your recommendation? We have insurance. So I would recommend the um, 20, the optional 20 uh, with a 5% deductible, um, just like Mr. Carlisle said, when we are, the risk, when the, the rates increase, we increase our policies and take the, the risk a little bit, take a little bit more risk. I'm not recommending the 5% on the, the $20 million option. Okay. Because, um, again, you're taking on about a $955,000 deductible should we have a big event to save $15,000. Yeah, but when you, I take the deduct the difference in deductibles, the difference is four hundred thousand. And when you include the savings, the the uh, you doing the deductible risk. on the twenty million instead of the forty five million? The twenty million. Yeah, it's applicable to the forty five million. The deductible is per value of the building, not the loss limit. So the deductible is So the it's value? not three percent of twenty million or five percent of twenty million, it's three or five percent of the building affected, which potentially every building could be affected, which would be forty five million. So if the damage is ten million, then what would the deductible be? Uh it depends on which building was affected. Okay, so So if every building let's say it's was one affected one of the other buildings. Again, I always have to talk about every building be affected because the cap five come through here, every building's gonna be affected, right? Um if we had $10 million of damage sporadically, but every building had a little bit of damage, our 5% deductible, again, would be uh, $2.2 million. The 3% is $1.3 million. So that's, that's where you get the difference every, of nine. That's catastrophic. In that's catastrophic. <laughs> every building had some damage, and we had to apply a deductible to every building's value. If it was just this building, just for reference again, at $23 million, um, at 5%, what did I say? It would be 1.1 million just for this building. And that's if we chose to execute that plan, right? If we had $1,000 of damage to a building, we said, hey, we're not going to file a claim on that building. We yeah. don't pay that deductible, sure. correct? Sure. Yeah. And you don't pay the deductible anyways. I mean, it's just deducted from the payment they pay you, right? So if, as long as you exceed the, the deductible on the building and they make a payment, they're going to deduct whatever the deductible was and then send you a check for it. So you're not, you're not paying them the money and then them paying you back. I have a motion on the floor and I have a second. All in favor, please state by saying aye. I need, do I need hands here? We, we might need to go down the, the line. Can you repeat? Dur I'm sorry, can you repeat? Because there was a lot of conversation in between. Yeah. Uh, uh, Director Canales, if you could m mute real quick, it'd be great. Thank you, ma'am. All right, Director Allison, we want to make sure we got you square. Correct. So obviously with the caveat that we need to procure this earlier next year, if at all possible, and with a few extra prayers, I move that we elect option to, with a $20 million loss limit at the 189756 premium, which includes a 3% deductible. Okay. And we have a second to that by Director Canales. Yep. We have a second. And I'll recall the question. All in favor, please state by saying aye and show me hands since it's hard to hear. Uh, I got aye. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Is that an eight, Matt? That's a halfway, Matt. It's up. <laughs> That's a, is that Director Chato? So is it unanimous? Yeah. Okay. All right. Motion carries. Thank you, gentlemen, Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good discussions, uh, Chase. Uh, but, uh, Thank you very much for Councilman, the Councilman, if you can get with staff to move this timeline up where we don't feel like our our backs against the wall yep. on hurricane season that'd be fantastic i appreciate it very much thank you sir thank you for all your hard work all right agenda item 14 <clears throat> update on the rcac committee activities miss montez good morning ma'am good morning sir <coughs> and thank you for the introduction sharon montez managing director of capital programs and customer services and welcome new board members Today, I'm here to present our, my monthly update on the RCAC committee, which is the committee for on accessible transportation here at the RTA. And basically, my monthly report we, for the meeting included a beeline update from Melanie Gomez. She's our eligibility coordinator for paratransit services. And in that presentation, she covered our no-show policy 
the eligibility policy and the 2021 beeline year end report. I also presented the fact that we had turned in the grant application for the Bono um, to support the procurement of 26 electric buses and a Robstown transfer station. We are in a holding pattern to hear back, fingers crossed, prayers. Uh, hopefully we'll hear something back from FTA by mid-August. Also presented information on the eminent arrival technology used by MV for our paratransit service and also presented the update on the metrics report. And basically our passengers per hour going up, that's really encouraging. Uh, monthly wheelchair boardings, 3,670. Upcoming meetings, we have a hiatus in July, but we have an August 18th meeting and a September 15th meeting. And that concludes my presentation, sir. Thank you. You're any, welcome. Qu any questions for Ms. Sharon? Thank you, thank you, Sharon. <coughs> Presentations, agenda item 15A. I'm gonna just give you all three, A, B, C. Well, A and B. Mr. Saldana. Oh, good morning, almost felt like good afternoon morning, by the time I, I get know up it. here. All right. This is one of the longest meetings I've ever been in. <laughs> Robert Saldana, Managing Director of Administration. So this aligns with the board priority of public image and transparency. Some of the highlights for the, for the month itself is bus advertisements over 100% of our baseline of what we budgeted for. Investment income is high just because we've had a low projection because interest rates are low, but since they've been going up, investment uh, income is, is high percentage-wise. And we drew down some federal and state, uh, mostly federal grants. We have a, for the new board members, we have a $17.6 million American Rescue Plan monies. We have about $7.5 million set aside for our shelter program. Then $10 million of it was gonna be for operational expenses, 5.6 to balance our budget this year, which we drew all that down this last month, and then 4.4 for next year. And we're gonna have a little conversation about the 4.4 in a little while. <clears throat> so just real quick, um, our revenues and expenses, and you see the May actual is the second column. We exceeded our revenues, exceeded expenses by 5.2 million, and that's because of the drawdown of the $5.6 million of, of federal funds. So we have total operating revenues of 9 million and total expenses of 3.8. We have some, the second row is our capital expenditures. So for CIP projects that we uh, did for the month, we spent $189,112. We re got reimbursed back a little over $59,000. So you see revenue over expense, expenditures of about $5.1 million for the month. This just breaks up our operating um, revenues and capital funding up top and all the expenditures in the bottom is just kind of repeat from the last slide, just a different slice of the pie. So the revenues, you can see the lion's share of the revenues comes from, usually comes from sales tax. Um, this is an estimated figure of $3 million because we won't receive our May sales tax till about a Monday or Tuesday next week. So that's a budgeted number. The 5.8 is the 5.6 of the federal funds for the American Rescue Plan we drew down along with some um, our last of our preventive maintenance 5307 monies. So total operating revenues are a little over 9 million. Capital grant donations again are reimbursing ourselves from some projects, 59,000. And then uh, total revenues are about $9.1 million. So you see our passenger service is about $94,000 or about 90% of our budgeted number, uh, which is, is up this month compared to previous months in there, which is good. Year to date, you'll see we're about 77%. I'll get to that in a little bit. This is again, the, the pie being sliced up a little bit different here, showing our total operating revenues up top and then our non-operating revenues on the bottom. As you can see, our operating revenues, revenues generated from our operations is only $120,000. $120,874. Passenger services of $94,000. Bus advertising at a little over 12,000. And then operating revenues, uh, CNG gas tax rebate of about $14,000. The rest of it here is coming from sales tax, $3 million, the federal grants, investment income, and the Staple Street Center. Those are non-operating. Just a pie chart of, of where the money uh, revenues or the expenses are coming from. And here's the expenses here. So obviously we like to have all our expenses below 
Uh, salaries and wages are a little over 100%, and that was more from an employee retention incentive that we had for the, that drew us over for that month. And then the corresponding benefits from that as well, too. And then miscellaneous, uh, the material and supplies is, is driven by uh, the fuel going up, and that's why we're over budget right now. So $3.55 million, almost $3.6 million of expenses for the month of May. Year to date highlights, bus advertisement, about $117,000 um, of budget, investment income, plus the 400% of budget, and then uh, federal, state, and grants, about $223,000. The reason why that's so high is with that 5.6, we intended initially to spread it out during the course of the year, and we do that on our, our budget for 112. But because interest rates are going higher, we decided to pull that money down earlier in the year and try to make money off our investments in there from commercial paper and textbook prime. So we pulled it all down in May. So year to date, uh, revenues, operating revenues of $22.4 million, expenses of 17.1. So year to date, we have a surplus of about uh, $5.3 million. Again, most of that driven by the American Rescue Plan of 5.6 that we had pulled down. And then from capital expenditures for CIP, year to date, we spent $895,000. We reimbursed ourselves $247,000 of that. So we have a, a revenue over expenditures for the year of about 4.6, almost $4.7 million surplus. That's just, again, the pie being spliced up again from that same. Our revenues year to date, sales tax, uh, about $15 million. Again, we'll get that $3 million more or less next week, and we'll know that number for sure. Um, our federal is about $6.6 .6 million uh, from our total prevailing maintenance for the year so far, that $800,000, and then the $5.6 million we pulled down. So total operating revenues of $22.4 million, capital grant donations of $247,000, total revenues and, and uh, reimbursements from grants, $22.7 million for the year. Just a pie chart of the expenses here, which is this right here. Salary and wages, about $6 million year to date. Benefits, $2.3 million. Services and supplies, about a, almost a little over a million dollars a piece. Purchase transportation, which is our B line and some small fixed routes, and volume fixed routes in there, about $3.4 million. The total uh, expense is about $5.6 million year to date. 15, I'm sorry, $15.6 million year to date. Fair recovery ratio for our new board members, fair recovery ratio is the amount of our fair revenues that pays for operational costs in there. So our fares pay for about 2.57% of our operational costs right now year to date wise. Just a 13 month sales tax. So in 2021, our actual for the month of May was a little over $3 million. Uh, we're projecting $3.74 million. Um, actually, that's what we received in April of 2022. For our budget, we budgeted 2.9 and received $3 million. So we budget, we received about $148,000 more this year in April than we did last year. Budget, uh, uh, Robert, if you could just touch on real fast, our yes, main sir. our main income, not fares, but it is sales tax. Sales tax, sales tax ranges yeah. percentage-wise. When you don't pull down a lot of grant monies in here, sales tax usually is about 73 to about 76 percent of your of our operating revenue income. income. Yeah. Actually, Thank non-operating. Operating is a small, small percent. Yes, sir. Questions? Any questions? I have one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, please. You have uh, the floor, Director Salazar. Saldana, mm -hmm. just uh, something for input. I think we've discussed this off the record or in committee meetings, actually in committee meetings. Uh, something to do with maybe getting a budget projection for the next two years. Uh, is it something you would support and you think it's important? Yeah, so later this month at the committee meeting this month on the 27th, we have our first budget workshop and we'll do a series of budget workshops until the budget's approved hopefully in, in November, most likely, for 2023. In that budget workshop in here, we'll go through all the depart department budgets. In the last budget workshop, we typically will give you the big picture. Here's what our operating revenues, our revenues are gonna look like and here's our expenses and if it's a balanced budget at that point in time. I can show you something, our first one projection earlier than that, so we have a little more conversation content during each of the budget workshops, so you can have it in there. 
on that last one as well too, we give you a five-year projection in there for revenues and, and expenses in there to tell you here's how we're trending, five years. all things being equal. The reason I'm bringing that up is because this money's gonna dry up. We should be getting uh, supplemental uh, funds to keep operating. If you recall, this 2022, we had a, a budget deficit of $5.6 million and we balanced it with the American Rescue Plan. That's what I'm saying. We have $4.4 .4 million, theoretically, to budget to balance the next year's budget. Um, CNO, I, CEO and I self had a little conversation. Just like the 5.6, when we typically would pull it down during the 12 months, we decided to pull it down earlier to, to make a little money off it from uh, commercial paper and textbook prime instead of not pulling that money down. There's no reason for it to sit in the federal government not earning interest for us. Same thing with that 4.4. I would like to myself pull it down this year so that we can start getting that interest right now as opposed to sitting there saying leave it out there for next year and balance the budget again next year with it. There's no reason again to leave that money sitting there and not working for us. So we'll be putting a projection based on less revenue based on yeah. the fact that we're not gonna be getting this supplemental money. What you'll do a couple of different things for us. So one, if we pull that $4.4 .4 million, they'll make our for lack of a better term, our financial statement look a little healthier because we're gonna use that money next year. Um, so our, our unrestricted reserves would go up. Just like right now we talked about, if you read in the body of your document, we have about $31 million of unrestricted reserves that are strictly unrestricted, unrestricted, not tied to anything. Now that money will dwindle down a little bit because we pulled that $5.6 million early in the year and that was, it's, it won't be there to balance the rest of the monies in each given month, but it's very early in the year so it's working for us. So that 31 million will dwindle down a little bit in there for that. Along with that, we have the American Rescue Plan. That's a big unknown right now. If we got the whole $61 million, we pulled the $11 million out of unrestricted reserves as our if we got local match. Full, if we got, if we got the full portion. portion. If we get something smaller than that, then that $11 million will go down, obviously, Something five million, like one million, whatever it happens. Long term, that yeah. there's gonna be a shift. So the $31 on. million is a little artificial right now because it'll dwindle down a little bit just because we pulled down the federal money early as opposed to late in the year and then depending on what the loan old grant looks like and as well. And is, inflation is costing everything from fuel to yes, sir. employment to employees. Correct. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, huh. I was um, following you on the um, operational expenses, year-to-date actual uh, salaries and wages. Oh, okay. That one? Yes. Okay. So you said, you had said two million but it says six million, and no. I was wondering, is that where that additional yeah, so four had, million? So I said initially six million dollars is is our salaries right now and wages. Um, it's a little over the hundred percent because we had some incentives that we gave out for retention. The two point three million dollars was the benefit side of it here. So we have benefits along with that, and benefits is usually somewhere around the thirty eight percent. Here it happens to be forty percent. Then we have the two million, uh, pretty close to two million, 1.8 million for services, 1.2 million for materials and supplies. And again, that's right about 100% or a little bit over because of the fuel cost that we have. When we first project the fuel, obviously that's a volatile commodity in there and it's, it's hard to project that. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions for Robert? Thank you, sir. On to the next one. I, I, I know we have some new board members. I could take it a lot slower and go a little more detail. Um, I just kind of judge it with a pace of what I think y'all might want to hear. So feel free to ask as many questions and I'll go back. All right, so procurement update. Uh, this aligns with the board priority of public image and transparency. So we have our current procurements, the procurements that are out in the street right now. We have our management information system. Um, we received two proposals in. I'll give you that part. Uh, they should come either to committee in July or August, depending on when we evaluate those two proposals in here. We're estimating about a million dollars in there for the cost of the five-year program. Um, our Texas ultra low sulfur emissions, our diesel fuel, we're looking for a two-year uh, firm fixed price and about a million dollars for the two years. Our two bus stops at the Del Mar campus, um, that will probably come straight to board in August. Uh, and that's about $2.3 million. We have some property for our new board members at the Clayburg Bank that we have at our Port Air Station in here. Uh, we went through a whole big process of uh, being historical. So we have to put out an RFP uh, for over a two year period and our RFP is usually six months. So we put four RFPs out. One came back with no proposals whatsoever to do anything here. We're issuing out the second RFP out in there. So that'll come back in November, maybe December to board. 
to let you know if we received any proposal to repurpose that building or not. For the four of them here, it comes out to about $4.3 million, $4.37 million. So this is the three month outlook for the CEO signature authority. Again, for the new board members here, our signature authority for the CEO is $50,000 or less. So all these items will be less than $50,000 that he can exercise on his authority. The West Westmatic uh, Corporation, which is our bus wash, we're looking for a one year with two one year options, about $15,000 a year. Elevator to services, a one year with two one year options, again, about $10,500 a year. Solid waste collection, one year with a one year option, about $45,000 a year. Our pest control services, a one year with two one year options, about $34,000 a year. Our IT uh, support services, uh, one year, about a little over $29,000 a year. Robert, quick question. Yes, sir. And this may be a John question. Um, are these contracts, the one-year options on our end, is that correct? Uh, they're bilateral. So we, we, either one of us, both have to, we both have to exercise that option in here. Okay. To it. Um, so what stops these from being effectively a $90,000 contract for the third one, for example? Uh, there's, there's nothing that stops it from being in there. It's just deciding do we decide to renew it or not. So, so from a legal perspective, wouldn't that have to go to RFP since it's over 50000 Or any of them like that are over fifty thousand for the option years, um, yeah, we're going to exercise those option years. It should be the total package, but the whole sum of the one year, three year, whatever we're going to. Were the option for. years included in the original RFP? Correct. It, technically, they did go out. Today. Yeah. So these all did go for RFP already. No, these are are going to go out for RFP. They're not on the street yet. They're coming up in the next three months. So, John, my question is: Do these fall under that fifty thousand limit when the total contract could be <clears throat> ninety thousand or more? It, it would be the based upon what our legal obligation is, which is if we haven't exercised the option year, it's less than fifty thousand um, dollars. So, yeah, you know, th this is within the his, his authority. He's ex when he exercises an option year on the solid waste, um, it's another forty five thousand dollars, but it's still within his legal authority of being under fifty thousand. I just haven't seen we haven't I haven't seen this with that many option years before, so I was curious. We Thanks. typically actually put in usually we used to do a two or three option years in there, so we're trying to get the option years now down. Um, sure. I can go into a little more detail of that. With, with inflation going up, having option years is going to be a little bit more difficult. Yeah. Well, when we talk about federally funded projects here, FTA is also looking for us, the industry itself, to get away from option years as well. A lot of people aren't exercised option years properly in the industry, so. FTA is a little shaky about that. So we're going to probably get away from a lot of option years at some point in time here. Okay. That also helps us define our risk, doesn't it? We have those option years. Yeah. Well, but they're typically, bilateral. Us typically, define, yes, typically in the option the years, we will we'll negotiate. We won't just exercise the option year. We'll go in there and negotiate depending on what is happening. Yeah. Well, there's not really a risk savings for us, right? Because they're bilateral. So the other company yeah. still has to say yes. So it's right. not like we can just say, hey, you're on the hook for another year at 45000 no, we have to both agree. They have to also agree. So a second page of this is two more, obviously, on here, is training services. Uh, one year, about $30,000. And then our ne network management services here, one year, about 32000 So the total for all six, five, seven of these are $196,135. And then everybody's favorite slide here, we have Marina uh, Space in here for about $6,100 a year that we spend for that. I'll take any questions. I have a question. Yes, sir. Does the does staff go out, on, especially the one that's real close to the 50000 do they go out because there's more than one disposal place? So it, it do, is you all go, do you all go, actually go through an RFP process? And the second question is, okay. this is for John, um, is it the board's uh, policy that can modify that to what I guess Director Wilbright was leading in that direction with regards to the limit if it's an option period, or is that something that's just uh, required by statute or law? Well, well, it's a matter of board policy so far as what the CEO's authority is right. uh, on an issue. But, I mean, generally, the CEO can only spend uh, up to $50,000. That's the only commitment. Right. Uh, but when you have Whether option years, six, and it could exceed that, um, but again, you wouldn't exercise it at that time. Is it? My question is, is that a policy, or is that something that the statute? 
the policy. Okay, so the policy could be amended if the board wished to say, okay, you're going to a three-year deal with an option, because typically we do exercise the options. I mean, we normally do. Uh, so I, I'm just you know curious if we do go out for an RFP with these things. Obviously, we'll, we get those reports, uh, Jorge. So we do, on these here, we, under $50,000, we don't go out for an RFP. Typically, at right. $50,000, we do, but we always get quotes out there for it here. We don't just go to one vendor and say, we're going to go with you. We still have to get quotes on anything right. just above a question. I mean, Just to make sure that even though it's under the board's uh, authority requirement, that we make sure we do our due diligence to make sure that we're continuing to search to make sure we're getting the best bang for the buck Correct. with our team. Yeah. We will go get quotes out there. We will still want competitive uh, procurements out there, not, not right. so much RFPs or IFBs or RFQs, but we want to make sure we're using taxpayer dollars properly. We use those services, and there's a quite a disparity right now in competition, so I urge staff to look at that. Any other questions for Robert? All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Robert. Thank you, sir. Uh, agenda item 15C. Derek, you're up. You're in the box. All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Derek Majak, the Managing Director of Operations. The board <coughs> priority for this item is public image and transparency. So for the highlights for the month of May, our passenger trips were up 26.7% to 232,467. And our revenue service hours were up 2.9%. And our revenue service miles were up 2.7%. And those increases are in good part to paratransit and the, the van pool increases. Here is a graph showing our ridership trend from 2019 through 2020, 2022. And for our system-wide monthly ridership by mode, as I mentioned, our system overall was up 26.7%, but still down 48.3% compared to our pre-COVID numbers. Our fixed route system was actually up 27.9%, but down 50.5% compared to our pre-COVID. Beeline, our paratransit service, was up 19.6% compared to last year, but down 24.1% compared to pre-COVID. And our FlexCB service, which is our on-demand service in Port Aransas, was up 49.3% compared to last year, but down 22.6% compared to pre-COVID. Our Vanpool program was up 8.7% compared to last year, and up 103.5% compared to pre-COVID. And those pre-COVID numbers included a decrease in the Vanpool program from Bechtel shutting down at that time. So we had a little bit of a lull for our Vanpool program started to increase again. And our rural services, which include services operated by Real and Fasano, and, and that were, are down 71.4% and uh, down 82.6% compared to pre-COVID. And our system-wide year-to-date ridership by mode, system overall was up 13.7% and down 52.1% compared to pre-COVID. Fixed route system is up 12.5%, but down 54.1% compared to pre-COVID. Our B-line services are up 28.2%, but down 28.5% compared to pre-COVID. The FlexiB service in Port Aransas is up 59.7%, but down 35.2% compared to pre-COVID. And our van pool services are up 25.4% and up 65.4% compared to the pre-COVID. And the rural services are down 32.7% for the year to date and 76.2% compared to pre-COVID. And for our fixed strap on-time performance, there's no issues here. You can see the increases in the wheelchair boardings and the bicycle boardings as our ridership has increased the last couple months. This is a list of the bond projects that were impacting our services in the month of May. Two of them, the Air Street, which impacted our Port Air Station, the approach, and uh, the service along Ocean Drive are, were completed in May. And this is a list of the upcoming bond projects that will be impacting our services. And there will be 79 additional bus stops that will be impacted or possibly closed. So our, our B-Line uh, service performance, the passengers per hour did not meet the metric. We still saw in May um, increase or issues with the cancellation rate. But now, while the June uh, operations report isn't completed, that number has come up quite a bit as the imminent arrival system that MV was talking about has gone online. So it's helped reduce the cancellation rate and confirming appointments with people. Miles between road calls were 18,000, so no issues there. This is the customer assistant forms to the last few years. We had six for the month of May, no issues there. 
and our miles between road calls for our large bus fleet, which is our, our Gaelic fleet, was at 7,580, still above our standard, though it did decrease from the, the high heat that we've been seeing. With that, I'll take any questions that you have. Uh, yes, ma'am. You have the floor. Uh, sir, I guess uh, out of curiosity, do you have any reason or knowledge as to why our rural services has gone down? I don't really have a reason, but talking with the Real over the last year, they've seen that across all the counties that they, they provide service on. The, the, there's been a limited number of people that have been trying to use their, their service. Now, we're hoping with the mobile app, once that goes through, the, and some other initiatives, we're, we're helping the, through Rita, we're, we're trying to promote that a little bit more, make people aware that that option is available to, to use Real and Fasano. But they've been seeing, it, at least for Real, they've been seeing it across all of their counties a decrease like that. And it, there's a, a little bit too that for the impacts that for Real provides a service for us to take people to DPS. And since the pandemic, DPS has moved to the, the schedule format and things like that. So, you know, I'm sure that played a part, you know, in their, their changes to their operations as well. Yes. Thank you. Um, we have about 30 um, bus stops that are closed due to detour. Are those bus stops also moved um, due to the detour? Like, are, are there, is there a way to set up like an alternate bus stop in those areas? So what, some of it depends on the significance. So if we look at the Ocean Drive, we had to move off of Ocean Drive. So when we did that, we're usually on PTNs that already have bus stops for existing services. So we'll just basically add the route number on there to show that they can do that. Now, sometimes there are shorter ones. So all that construction on Staples and around the six points, yes, we have what we call temporary rim stops that we can set up, you know, if it's short term, or we can mount another pole in the ground on other roads. That way we can provide some service in that area as we go through. Now, what we don't do is we don't stop in the construction zone because, you know, there's safety issues, people entering and exiting, and we don't want pedestrians entering into that area. Right. Is that routine for it to be, you know, knowing that we have that many bus stops closed down due to construction, is that an automatic, you know, let's look at the map and see what where we can set up some alternate? Yes, our, our service development team actually participates in um, the monthly meetings with uh, Flatiron Dragados in the, the city of Corpus Christi, and then we maintain daily communications with the city on their, their bond projects and through the completion process. That way we know ahead of time when they're getting ready to finalize or if they're done and they're just waiting for the cure and that, then they give us the approval when the road's safe and then we'll, we'll go out there, inspect it ourselves and then put the, the poles back. But for every, every bond project, we do that analysis. Then we go out and we look at it to see the safe route for our buses because where cars can travel doesn't mean that a 40 foot bus can travel on. And then, and then we, we determine where it's safe to put stops and where they meet ADA compliance as well because we can't just drop people off into a, a ditch basically or, or in somebody's front yard. Right, and do we, since we received the reports for the um, bus stops that are on detour, do we get a report of the temporary additions due to the construction? We have not generated a report, a report like that previously, but it doesn't mean that we, we couldn't at the, t the time. Any other questions for Derek? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Derek. Yes, sir. Uh, sorry, yes, please. I had one more. Yes, ma'am. Uh, um, you were talking about the app. Are we on that yet? Are we going to come back to that? Actually, that was on the consent items for the the, the, Dar the Dallas app area rapid transits mobile go mobile ticketing app called GoPass. We're going to join that along with there's five or six other Texas transit agencies that are they're on there. So. Now that they have board approval, now we have to go through a process for DART's board to approve it, which will their committee will hear it in June in, or in July 12th, and their board will hear it in August. In the meantime, we're going to be sharing the data so we can progress towards getting our mobile ticketing app and scheduling app up and running. Okay. We're, with so that anticipated, we're hoping to have it up and running before the end of October. Okay. So one of my concerns when I was reviewing the notes um, on that is the majority of, of the people that ride the bus are you know normally not as tech savvy is there a program or a time or a location or some type of process 
is going to be set up to teach individuals how to use this app? Yes, we will. And actually, because DART's already been through this with several of the other agencies, they already have kind of a prepackaged marketing and, and instructional campaign for the riders and for staff. And then we'll just tailor it to meet our community needs and the needs of our staff to implement it. We've already been working with uh, Rita, and she's been working with her staff so that we're, we'll be prepared when we have a chance to, to go live. Obviously, even large agencies, when they implement this, you know, it's a continual process. You may see the first year 7 8% you know, usage, and the, the goal is obviously to continue to increase that e every year. So is there a plan currently set up to, you know, sh set up shop, let's say, at the large, um, larger facilities that have a, a lot more ride share to set up a tent and have somebody coach them and teach them well, how to set up these apps? Or? Well, we've talked about a lot of that, but until we have the board's approval, we didn't want to reach out to anybody like the universities or colleges or anybody else because if I went and told them about this and it spread and then the board voted it down, then it would uh, <laughs> not okay. be very positive for okay. any of us. So now, now that we have the board's approval and DART's confident that their board's going to approve it, now we can start beginning our the initial phases of our outreach and setting up points where we can have discussions because there's there's the ability to do um, basically a cash to mobile app. So the way others do it, they can go into like Fiesta or 7-Elevens and because not everybody has a credit card and you can give them $10 to load into your account. So we have those things. We need to start talking with the local vendors too, whether it's HEB or 7-Eleven or, or wherever. And I brought up those same questions and concerns at committee meetings and I was also looking at that same and there was actually three or four items and I thought we were going to cover them under that, but that's okay. Out to the senior board. It, and we'll provide some instructional um, training and videos Great and things question. like that to help the, the board members as well. That way, when you're out there in the community, you can help. help yeah, I the presume that would be in English and Spanish, correct? Yes. yes, they actually have 10 different languages that, that, oh, wow. that it's offered in. Okay. So. Great. Fantastic. Any other questions for Derek? Sorry, I'm just filling in the holes here. Oh, no, no, I, no, I, no, I, no, I, yeah, I completely okay. understand you're, you're both new, so you have lots of questions. Not a problem at all. Uh, any other questions for Derek? All right. Thank you, Derek. Appreciate it. Agenda item uh, 16, CEO uh, report. Yes, sir. Welcome Marissa, back, can sir. you load me up? Welcome back. And welcome back. Yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Over over the, the, the past month, we've uh, participated in several community events, and uh, which in essence required us to do some special movements. They are, for example, we did the free rides during the City of Corpus Christi uh, cooling center uh, dates where we moved people from our bus stops to uh, the, the cooling centers. We've also shuttled to uh, provided shuttles for the County Judges and Commissioners Association Conference. That was in town from June 13th through the 16th. We also participated in the emergency evacuation drill on uh, June 17th. Uh, operation health and wellness programs that were also provided through the community. And uh, we did do the free ride to the Big Bang celebration on July 3rd. Additionally, on the, uh, the media programs, we paid particular attention to our Port Aransas Express. Uh, the emergency evacuation drill, putting the word out that we were participating, cooling center transportation. Uh, APTA has the dump the pump day, which we participated and put some words out, uh, in encouraging people to be m uh, mindful of the fossil fuels. Operation health and wellness programs that the city was involved with. A uh, cheaper alternative to driving feature, pointing out the benefits of riding transit during rising uh, prices of the fuel. Uh, active shooter training, which I think was very timely that we were provided uh, many of our people here in this building. And uh, the, again, the, the Big Bang celebration that uh, we participated in. And we show some pictures of uh, some of the events that we were uh, involved with. And uh, we've received uh, some more awards, uh, uh, five SWAT awards, the Spotlight Award, which uh, uh, acknowledges employee appreciation days that we've had here at the RTA. We've also uh, participated with Buck Day Parade events and won some um, 
recognition for our participation. Uh, the, the Buck Days uh, bus wrap, which is it's illustrated there. Uh, social media, Children's Buck Days, uh, our, our crew participated very nicely and, and won the award for the best costumes and activity. And uh, the uh, job fair radio ad program that we participated in. So we've uh, <coughs> it's, it's been a, a busy but hot <coughs> month uh, for the RTA. Upcoming events calendars: uh, the SWATA conference in July <coughs> 25th through the 7th. Uh, the APTEC transit board and administrative seminars uh, for July 30th through August 2nd. And this may be some good uh, training sessions for our new members to, uh, to attend uh, the APTA Transit Board <coughs> Administrator Seminar. And in mid-August, the FTA Low Fuel Grant Application Announcement, uh, the big, big award uh, that we hope to be recognized with our uh, efforts to fuel uh, with electricity in Corpus Christi. And again, that uh, that takes uh, uh, the activity that we've been involved with uh, to be out there in the community showing that uh, we do care about the community and we do care about our riders and uh, want to do it safely and, and, and carefully. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Any questions for Jorge? Jorge, where will that conference be held? The APTA conference? The, the SWATA conference? conference. APTA. SWATA. Sorry? Which conference, Igor? Uh, if you could back up the file on the APTA, the one that seminars. SWATA. No. No, the other one. The other one would be the APTA. So if anybody wants to go, I guess they need to start making plans. Yeah. That. That's correct, sir. Well, I didn't hear where that one was located. Utah. Salt Lake. Salt Lake. Salt Lake. And that's the one on the 30th and the 2nd? Correct. I believe so. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jorge. Any other questions for Jorge? All right. Here none. Uh, board chair report. Uh, nothing new to report, but what I'd like to do is, as uh, custom, start with Mr. Aaron again. Uh, three yeah, times in one meeting. Say, yeah, three times. Man. It's fun. Call it, calling you out. I know, right? <laughs> uh, just want to say uh, congratulations to Director Mamie and uh, Director Coleman. Uh, on being appointed to the RTA board. I've heard a lot of positive things about you from people in the community, and obviously, Jeremy, we've had the opportunity to get to know each other through LCC. Uh, so just really looking forward to working with you all. We're really excited about, about what you all bring to the board as well, so, so uh, congrats and welcome. Um, uh, to the staff, um, good job, obviously, um, with the, the recognition. I'm really excited about the, our interlocal agreement with DART. I think this app uh, is a, a unique opportunity that we have to increase ridership amongst uh, people that don't normally ride the bus. Uh, like I've, I, I've, I've told a million times before, anyone who's never rode a bus before, I don't care if you're the most educated person in the world, it's an intimidating experience. Uh, so to Director Mamie's point and to Director Salazar's point of you know increasing that education to get people more comfortable Using the app, you know, I, I downloaded the app myself. I played around with it, pretended like I was in Dallas, you know, taking the bus from here to there. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a really intuitive app, the, the way that it's set up. And I'm really excited for, for you know, obviously, if, you know, with Dart approval, you know, Corpus being able to be added to the, to the app as well. And hopefully, you know, as, as it continues to grow, maybe some larger, larger uh, service areas like the Valley and Houston uh, we'll be able to join as well, and then that way we'll have something that we'll be able to use throughout the whole state of Texas. You'll be able to ride the bus pretty much anywhere. Uh, so definitely, you know, kudos on that. And then the one thing that I would finally add with is for the procurement process when it comes to the insurance, uh, just to the staff. You know, these are the types of things that you know we are, we are, we're up here making difficult decisions, and we just want to be able to work with you to give us the you know the amount of time that we need to be able to make the best decision that we can that benefits not only the organization but the staff. And, and our users as well. Um, so, you know, whatever you need from us to work on the, the procurement issue, if there are other issues like this that are, you know, potentially you can see coming down the road, Jorge or, you know, or anyone else, you know, start working with us now so that we, you know, are able to bring together all of the, because even today we didn't have necessarily all the kind of information, you know, in one nice little neat package that we could kind of evaluate. So that would be my own, you know, my one constructive comment that I would say, but. <coughs> 
as always, thank you so much for your hard work. We really appreciate everything, and uh, I, you know, thank you for everything you do for the organization. Thank you, Director Munoz. Uh, Director Coleman. No comments, sir. Right, thank you. Director Salazar. Well, congratulations to both of you. The two people that were next to the one is here. <laughs> Put all you city folks on one side, it looks like. Congrats on, on each side. Except for Matt. <laughs> my chair. Matt, you can move over here. Nope, I'm keeping my chair. <laughs> um, but all kidding aside, congratulations, Mr. Coleman. I've seen you on TV a few times. You speak very well, and you get to the point, and uh, you get to here, and I appreciate everything you've done. I look forward to working with you. Also, Director Coleman, congratulations on your that support of the council here in both um, with regards to the options of the, the insurance, those options were not there at our regular meeting. These were options that were presented today, so hence a lot of conversation, a lot of questions. If we'd have had them before, uh, then it would have been a little different. The fact that they were presented at this meeting is good, but by the same token, they were items that we were having an option to present. So we can get that information. and I'm glad that we have someone on the research team. I know a little bit just to be dangerous, but I'm glad that we <laughs> have some good uh, comments and questions that we can ask. Thank you, Director Salazar. Director Mamie. I just want to say thank you, everyone. I'm excited to be here, excited to be a part of this board. Thank you for welcoming me. Um, you know, it's a, a, a big shoe to fill, so um, I'll do my due diligence to, to do my part um, and gather as much information and data that I need um, as far as the insurance portion you know it seemed like it was last minute type decision is that something that we can start you know sooner I think, that was, the, in the, the I think that was in the motion today to, 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 to move that timeline up uh, earlier in the year okay <clears throat> and other than that great meeting thank you nice to meet everybody thank you for welcoming me thank you director Mamie madam vice chair Welcome to this evening, board members. I look forward to collaborating with you guys on this board. Welcome, and let me know if you have any questions. I'll try to be as helpful as I can. Um, staff, um, I'm proud to be part of the RTA board. Uh, you guys make me proud. All the awards, all the hard work and efforts, very evident. So I appreciate you guys doing this for us. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Director Wilbright. Great job, staff. Erica and Jeremy, welcome to the team. Thank you, sir. Director Charro. Welcome to uh, welcome to the board, and I look forward to um, working with both of you and getting to know you all. And of course, congratulations to the staff. You always do a great job um, on your uh, your work. So congratulations. Great. Uh, welcome to the board, uh, Director Coleman, Director Mamie. Uh, look forward to working with you. Um, we got a great staff here. Uh, they work very hard. But if you have any questions, please reach out to me. My door is always open. And uh, any other business in front of the RTA? Today. Karen Dunn. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Director Canales. Uh, Director Mamie and Director Coleman. Uh, unfortunately, I could not be there today, but I look forward to meeting with you both and working with y'all, and I'm excited to have you all on the board. Uh, also, wanted to uh, welcome Jorge back. We've missed you. Uh, glad you're back. Hope you had a great time. And uh, also, a shout out to the staff who is done an amazing job. Those awards make us look really good, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Director Canales, and I, I apologize for, for almost passing you up there. Thank you, ma'am. Enjoy your time over there. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Any other business in front of the Corpus Christi Regional Transportation Authority? Karen Dunn and I adjourn the meeting at 10.35 a.m. There we go. Yes.